hope our mic is working. Well, welcome everybody to um, Veritas Forum tonight. It is my distinguished pleasure to, uh, uh, to be the moderator for this event and the provocateur of some interesting questions surrounding an issue that we're all involved in, and that is, what is happiness? Can we achieve happiness? Uh, does happiness differ for different people? And I hope we're also going to be delving into the issue of the impact of spirituality on the achievement of happiness, or at least the, the experience of happiness, and then maybe delve a little bit deeper into uh, depression and anxiety, which is a huge issue here on campus, especially in this pressured environment of the, of the Ivy League. So I just, um, I'm going to ask our speakers to each make opening statements at the podium, and we're going to try to restrict those to about 10 minutes each, and then we're going to come back here and dialogue and try to compare and contrast your visions and your science and your knowledge of what makes happiness. So Dr. Eagle, would you take Thank you. Thank you. All right, seems it's like, like it's working. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me here. I, I cherish the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, happiness, mental health, and in the university setting specifically. So the first question I was asked to address is uh, given your academic background and worldview, how do you define happiness? Um, I find uh, the premise of the question or the introductory part a bit strange, um, because um, as far as I can tell, the world doesn't care about anyone's worldview. So this question is a bit in my mind to this one. Given your academic background and worldview, how do you define gravity, or hunger, or depression? Um, happiness is a bit different in that we all have intuitions about happiness, but then people had intuitions about gravity as well. So what do you do? To understand how the world works, what you do is you do science. Um, so very, very briefly in one slide, basically, what happiness is, this is a question for psychology, so the fundamental distinction is between two kinds of happiness, the, the momentary or, or joy component. This is what you um, get to feel and report when you're asked how are you right now? How, how happy are you right now at this moment? And the complementary aspect is uh, uh, more about life satisfaction, and this is typically what people answer in response to questions such as uh, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? So kind of retrospective, going back uh, for longer if you have lived longer. So for some of us, this question carries more weight. Uh, and then that was what happiness is. Uh, and we have to ask why happiness is, and, and that's uh, a question whose exploration one has to start uh, in one place, because happiness is a biological phenomenon. We have to start with evolution. As uh, Fyodosidus Dobzhansky pointed out uh, a long time ago, um, in, in an open letter addressed to American teachers, actually, he wrote that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, Few statements have rung truer than this in, in my experience in, in the disciplines that, that uh, I'm, I'm connected to, I feel, I feel an intellectual connection to. So a bit more specifically, here's a quote from a somewhat more recent paper by Richard Nessie on um, the evolutionary underpinnings of happiness. I'll just read because I think it's a great way of putting things. We were not designed for happiness, neither were we designed for unhappiness. Happiness is not a goal left unaccomplished by some bungling designer. It is an aspect of a behavioral regulation mechanism shaped by natural selection. And uh, this is a long paper, very well worth reading. Uh, if you want a PDF, just ping me, I'll send you a copy. Very, very well, well worth reading. With many insights which actually apply, many of them apply specifically to mental health. 
I don't have time uh, in, in the remaining seven minutes or so to go into any kind of detail, but uh, just want to recommend that paper to you. So how to be happy? This is where you come in. This is your call, subject to terms and conditions. Uh, here's a great illustration from the New York Times cartoon by Brian Ree. Um, I don't have to comment on it, basically have a look and you'll, you'll find you'll discover new ways of being happy. They're just wonderful. I mean, some of them are ways for your pet to be happy. Um, and this is really for, for, for people from all walks of life. Uh, one can find here uh, a lead if, if you need uh, to be told uh, how to be happy. Like, what makes you happy? You know, ask yourself and, and you, you'll, you'll get to know something about yourself in that manner. But not free for all, subject to terms and conditions, as I said, subject to the most serious constraint, which is we are human, we are animals of a particular species, and this constrains what we can do and how, how happy or not we can be. Uh, this is what makes uh, me happy, another red dot in, a, in this case in an expansive landscape. Uh, but I, I have to move on to the second question I was asked to address. Uh, what about happiness and mental health in a university setting specifically? So what makes me often happy uh, working at the university, especially at this great university, is that I do science, uh, which Francis Bacon, one of the originators of the concept of science, uh, that, that prompted his, his ideas prompted the founding of the um, Royal Society, the first academy of sciences on this planet, wrote science is not to overcome an adversary in argument, but nature in action, and there is no uh, more challenging call to action out there that I know of. And uh, uh, to quote the Latin saying from which the Royal Society took its motto, nullius in verba, nullius addictus iurare in verba magistri, quome cumque rapid tempestas de feror hospes. Uh, my words are not owned by any master. Where the winds of reason lead me, there I find home. So we scientists don't answer to authority and we are not bound by doctrine. And I find it exhilarating. Now, what helps me, again, specifically about myself, remain somewhat sane at the university, maybe another Latin quote, mens sana in corpore sano, um, a lot of physical activity. I swim, I cycle, I hike, I lift weights. Very, very highly recommended. If you find time for that, you'll be much happier for that. Unfortunately, most people have it much harder. I realize, I fully realize, that I'm very highly privileged in many regards. Happiness is hard to focus on because well-being depends on many things, and most of them are denied to those without power and money. Here's an illustration from a recent paper on, on sustainability, which uh, shows in a graphical form some of the factors, some of what it takes for a person to be happy. Health, education, work and leisure, agency and political voice, social relationships, stable ecosystems, and on and on. And so no power, no money, you will be denied that. And even mental health is weighed on the scales of profit. So here is a page, the front page from the report uh, that had been commissioned by the state of California from the RAND Corporation, looking at whether or not it pays off to give better mental health treatment to the students at the in California, the three, the three university systems, the, the U of C, uh, the Cal State, and, and, the, and the community colleges. And uh, they found out the bottom line is uh, there is benefit for California of $6.49 for each dollar invested in that one year when spending on mental health of students was boosted. Um, well, uh, think of it what you may. I find it strange to have mental health weighed on those scales. And I want to ask, why are things this way? And you know, we may be even going to get some happiness out of finding out why, because as Virgil wrote, happy is he who knows the causes of things. So what's the cause of this strange thing when mental health uh, is thought of in terms of dollars? You know, this is related to things like why universities in general, and Cornell specifically, can afford only to support short-term counseling for their students as opposed to unlimited counseling, this kind of stuff. That's what I'm talking about. So the question to ask is qui bono, another Latin phrase. I don't know what's, what's with Latin in me this day. I somehow I'm fixated on Latin. Uh, who profits? So ask who profits and you'll find out. Who profits uh, from the people's low wages, unemployment, personal insecurity, intolerance, scientific illiteracy, choosing religion over reason? And who profits from the state's foreign interventions, from the war on illegal aliens, so-called, 
the war on drugs, the war on education, the war on women, and the war on minorities, and, and all the fingers point in the same direction. It's those who are in power that profit. So what can we do and what should we do to related questions? Um, in the interest of time, I don't have much left, if any. A very quick advice to make life better for yourself and everyone else, which, believe me, there is data to show for that will make you happy, not just everyone else happy, if you help everyone else. Do two things, pursue personal goals alongside systemic change. And I'll leave you with that. If you want to know more about things, some of the things I said, or what this symbol means, or just want to talk to me, I'm easy to find. My door is open. Come and talk to me. I'll be, I'll be happy to talk to you about anything at all in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right. Um, thank you all for coming out to uh, hear us talk about these things. Thanks, Shimon, for your, uh, your speech. I think this is a, a fascinating subject, and I'm glad that we're having the, the space and time to talk about it. Um, so the question is, what is, what is happiness? And I, I think to begin, I'll, I'm going to go over some just what a strange thing it is. Um, so one thing is that happiness is something that we all seem to want. Um, it's for the young and for the old. Um, some people jump out of planes, some people sit motionless for hours. It's also something, at least on some level, that happens to good people as well as to bad people. Humans have sought happiness by forming steel for violence and by making miracles out of silicon. But what is it? Allow me to jump species for a moment and let us consider the noble sled dog. Sled dogs are made to run. Humans somehow bred wild wolves to forget just about everything about killing and remember only the part about uh, being a wolf that is running. Uh, it's, the, the, if cross-species understanding means anything, these dogs were, uh, want to run. And I propose that having a purpose for living and pursuing that purpose is a key to what happiness is. The Holocaust survivor and psychiatrist Viktor Frankl said, Striving to find one's meaning, um, sorry, striving to find meaning in one's life is the primary motivational force in man. And I think this insight goes right to the bottom of our biology. Um, when we lack purpose, we just simply die. Our bodies rebel. Um, here's a study showing that purposelessness um, has been found to be an independent risk factor for dying, uh, like smoking. Compared to a person with low purpose, uh, those with high purpose have a 14% uh, reduced risk of dying year by year. Um, and this is really astonishing, that there's, there's some really significant uh, uh, connections with, with who we are and uh, having an idea of a purpose to, to follow. Uh, but for humans, it's not so obvious what we want. Um, nobody, as far as we knew, bred us to do anything in particular. There seems to be little superficially in common between a Viking and Steve Jobs. But there must be. As a psychiatrist, I am best qualified to answer the question in the negative. What makes people unhappy, and how do we make them not unhappy? Which is almost like happiness, but uh, at least it's, uh, if we think those things are on a similar uh, axis, then, uh, then th that might speak to the question. Now, a big part of my job has been, taking, is, has been talking to people on the worst day of their lives. One of my uh, jobs was to be the on-call psychiatrist uh, at Stanford or the VA in the emergency room. The emergency room doctors would call me to assess people who came in with suicidal thoughts. It would be my job to talk with the patients and to decide if coming into the hospital would be helpful. And over the course of my time at Stanford and the VA, I've had hundreds of such conversations. The theme is tragedy, divorce, addiction, disappointment, despair, people whose lives lacked purpose. Or more often, people whose lives had purposes, but they were frustrated. What they wanted had been taken away, and it seemed like there was no way they could ever get their lives back on track. My clinical experience matches the literature on suicide. Um, suicide risk is highest when a person believes the following thoughts. I am a burden. 
I'm alone, and I'm not afraid to die. So let's leave the emergency room and come to the college campus. You, at least most of you, there's a few older people here, are a bright young person sitting in this discussion listening to me, and you might be wondering, why are there so many mental health challenges now? In fact, our introduction uh, touched on that. And I must admit that I tend to be pretty skeptical of the things are getting worse and worse narrative. Um, and as I was preparing for the talk, I, I wanted to uh, question the premise a bit. Um, and I did, but sadly, things are in fact getting worse. Um, here's a study going back to the 1940s on the same scale. Um, depression in college students is higher than it's ever been in recorded history. And suicide in college students is the highest it's ever been in recorded history. Um, and that's just, that's just very heavy. Um, but the, the question is why? Um, so first, let's consider one of those, one of those three things, um, the thought, I am alone. Um, this has increased rather dramatically over the past several decades nationally. Um, in 1985, the median American had three people with whom he or she could talk with about important matters. In 2004, the number had dropped to one. Among college freshmen in recent years, the number of people spending almost no time socializing um, has increased rather steeply. And along this, and possibly driving it, more and more people are excessively into themselves. By standard measures of narcissistic personality, uh, we are more and ever more narcissistic. Um, second, let's consider the thought, I'm a burden. And let's consider what it means to be a burden. It means that one's purpose has been frustrated, and one's mere existence has begun to frustrate the purposes of others. Worse than just being a lone wolf, one feels disconnected from the affections of others, but one feels connected enough to pull down the social web like a dead weight. We should pull our weight, we all know, but how much weight should we be pulling? The standards, internally and externally, have increased. We are more perfectionistic. We, are more, we demand more perfection of others. We feel that others demand more of us, and we demand it more of ourselves. And I'll suggest one more domain that requires an historical aside. Um, there's a, the story uh, popular among scholars goes like this. About a century ago, a lot of people believed a lot of things really strongly, like communism or Nazism. Then we had a lot of wars because everybody believed they were right so strongly, so people started doubting whether anybody should ever be really sure of anything. Then we started doubting all, all sorts of things. The civil rights movement, uh, the sexual revolution in Vietnam pretty well convinced everybody that traditional institutions were corrupt and the truth was relative. So today we doubt the church and the corporation and the government, um, as well as any system of thought that might allow us to discriminate between the infinity of options before us. Everything is relative. Well, everything that is except money. That's real. In the absence of convictions about trans uh, transcendent things, we are left with merely material ones. And millennials have broken all records on how many of us want to get rich as a top life goal. 81%. Purposes beyond the purely mercenary are harder than ever to sustain in a world of relativism. And so, while few like to admit it, a good job is what all must be sacrificed for. So, current college students are more narcissistic, lonely, and perfectionistic, adrift in an endless sea of options, clinging to the plank of getting rich as the only trustworthy goal. So, I've argued that having a purpose matters. And if you followed me thus far, my professional qualifications are at their end. Um, so, in terms of uh, advice as a psychiatrist, I think that these are some of the trends that I see commonly in my college-aged patients and uh, patients at Stanford, um, that the, the, the loneliness and the perfectionism, and these are things that, uh, whether it be in therapy um, or, or otherwise, trying to, trying to respond to these things is, is an important factor. But for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to take off my psychiatrist hat um, and speak to you as a mere fellow traveler on this journey we call life. So with my psychiatrist hat off, the first question I'd like to ask is whether any old purpose will do. There's a multitude of possible purposes, uh, but we must consider that some of them might be very, very bad. Whatever we do, we don't want Hitler to have the ultimate good thing that we're talking about. But how do we keep him from it? And another question I think we should ask about our happiness is whether it is robust to tragedy, the central one being death. As summarized by a grief counselor at UCSB, Steve Smith, humans have, quote, 
a highly evolved sense of self-consciousness and individuality that is combined with the knowledge that we are mortal and will eventually die. And I think that as a species, we're not really into that idea at all." End quote. So, can there be happiness that responds to the, that is, uh, that responds to the tragedies of evil and death? Can there be a purpose for human beings that leaves Hitler out and which is more than a smokescreen to distract us from our ultimate fate? One divergent thinker was particularly opposed to the standard answers. He liked to disrupt the status quo. To those who thought positive affect was the goal, he said, how blissful those who mourn, for they shall be aided. To those who prospered, um, who proposed beating others and achieving fame, he said, how blissful the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. To those who proposed it was wealth, he said, how blissful the destitute, abject in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. To those who suggested that having any desires was the problem, he praised desire. How blissful those who hunger and thirst for what is right, for they shall feast. Everything is on its head. In other words, the secret to happiness is not to seek happiness. It's to sell happiness and get something better. The man, if you haven't guessed already, is Jesus, and I'm quoting the Sermon on the Mount. We started the talk with the noble sled dog, whose purpose was to run. I believe that the purpose of the human being is to love. The purpose of the human is to desire the good of others, so much so that one would be willing to sacrifice oneself for them. It is to, uh, it is to imagine how the world could be a better place for them and to try to make it real. What's the purpose of life? Love. Love the highest thing you can conceive of with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. Follow the example of Jesus, who was the ideal hero, satisfying all our mythic desires uh, for one to fight the chaos and darkness in the world. The purpose of life is to reject self-judgment and the judgment of others, to reject perfectionism, and to receive unconditional love, the kind that says, come as you are. The purpose of life is to love even if it costs us every dollar or shred of reputation. The purpose of life is to love other people and share this love far and wide. Because bringing people together, drawing them in, particularly if they are alone or rejected, is, is just exactly what love does. Love because it's the fabric of the very universe. Love everyone, even your enemies. Love even, even in the face of hatred and death. Love. I've heard a lot of answers to the question, but for myself, I've found none better. Thank you. So we had a lot to digest in just these uh, two talks, two different, very different perspectives on what happiness is. And I'm going to try and compare and contrast your two worldviews. So, uh, Shimon, I'm going to ask you the first question. Um, in part of your writing, you wrote a very interesting sentence that I want you to dissect for us and explain. And you said, um, when fishing for happiness, catch and release. And I'm assuming you mean by that that uh, happiness is fleeting, that it's not an enduring phenomenon for any individual. I saw the picture up there of you sitting on the mountaintop looking out. <laughs> I'm assuming you didn't sit there for long. Can you elaborate a little bit on the fact that is there a state of happiness or at least a, a steady state of happiness that one can achieve? Or is this always a fleeting catch and release? So the evolutionary constraint on us, which, which translates into physiological constraints, because of course physiology is what keeps this computational machine running, is such that uh, we are just not wired for constant happiness, because uh, happiness is a, is a stimulus, it's a goad. It's a goad, it's a stimulus to keep us going, um, to move on, to leave this foraging patch, to move on to the next one. Uh, to maybe try to attain a goal, maybe to attain it, but then to move on to the next goal. And the stimulus that is constantly on is just not effective, as every psychologist and physiologist knows. And that's why we cannot have constant happiness. We are, we are kind of doomed for occasional happiness, which is just fine by me, because as soon as I come down from a mountain, I, I can look forward to climbing the next one. And this, of course, should be taken metaphorically. We should, we should set to ourselves, Goals one after another, as you said, purpose, one purpose after another. Mine is not as lofty as yours, maybe more practical. And uh, once we attain them, we move on to the next one. Once we fail to attain them, we should not dash our heads against the rock. In fact, one of the lessons from that evolutionary paper, which I cited and quoted from, is that people are often miserable because they have set themselves goals which are unattainable and, and, and they face obstacles which are insurmountable. 
And one, one has to know oneself to realize when that's the case and move on and thereby be happy and uh, then miserable maybe for a while, but then happy again and again and again. Can I ask a follow-up question in, in relation to that? Um, you are a computational psychologist, so I'm, I'm not going to delve too deeply into the mechanisms of the brain. Uh, but you do write about the fact that your past experiences had sort of an, a c constant, uh, um, constant thinking about where you want to be and reflecting on where you were. And I wanted to ask the question, what about individuals that have very, very stressful experiences in life, and I'm thinking particularly in my area that I work in, in at child welfare, where there's child abuse, sexual abuse, um, abandonment, where the residual uh, remembrances that you're bringing forward to the future actually um, color how you see the future and your goals of the future. What role do you think one's upbringing, particularly stressful upbringing, pay, plays in the achievement of any degree of happiness in the future. And as, as I said, my privilege doesn't allow me, I really, I feel very uncomfortable speaking to those cases because I know none firsthand. I'm married to a therapist who meets such cases on a daily basis and I hear from her that uh, people are wonderfully resilient and sometimes you just wouldn't expect someone, a young person, 18, 19 year old person having come through some terrible stuff and, and still enduring the terrible stuff. Uh, pulling through and, 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 and holding themselves together. Uh, but uh, I, I, I just, I, I don't feel qualified to speak to that. And, and uh, uh, we can just only look to those, people, those people who, who, who make it through and, and succeed and, and hold themselves together and, 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 and move on sometimes in, in, in full knowledge that they have come through or, or are still experiencing those terrible conditions. But just one thing I want to mention is you don't have to try to carry, carry the burden alone. You, you don't have to think that you're alone. There is always someone who will help, and very often there will be a mental health professional who will help, and those are the best people to turn to in such cases. Don't, don't try, don't, don't, don't carry the burden alone. It's very, very hard to do so alone. Mm -hmm. And David, maybe I could ask you to respond to something that you said that relates to this. And you were talking about people who were in crisis and uh, people who are very depressed and maybe suicidal. And uh, two of the characteristics that you said that you noticed in those individuals was individuals who felt that they were a burden and they no longer had a, a, a purpose in what they're doing. Now, people who feel they're a burden on others tend to be more socially aware and uh, care about other people. Uh, do you think that, being so, that the people who are very socially aware and care for other people are more likely to be depressed? So it's, it's a good question, and I think it's a good question um, both on the uh, sort of social level as well as on the, the therapeutic level. And, and I think that one of the things that we often do in therapy is help people see how their qualities that maybe have gotten them into trouble, uh, a personality trait or a quality that they've experienced, how that might be an asset rather than just something that's causing problems. Um, and I think that, um, as Shimon said, there's, you know, that there are uh, all of these cases of, of people who have had terrible childhoods or terrible tragedies that have happened to them um, that have, uh, you know, with, often with help, or at least maybe it's a selection bias because we're the ones helping and that's what we see. Those are the people we see get better. But, but certainly, um, often by getting help, people get a lot better. And I think often it's by, by seeing um, how it is that they're... Um, the way, they're, the way they are um, can, be, can be good, can be positive. Um, and also seeing how the emotions that they're experiencing have truth to them. Yeah, I think that oftentimes it's people suppressing sadness, pushing it away, um, not sort of looking at it and say, geez, my life really is quite sad because of these circumstances. Looking that in the face, uh, mourning it, and then moving on. That's, that's often the, um, the process. Um, and there are people who have, you know, genetically or biologically have different dispositions, um, and, uh, but, and that uh, sociability tends to be uh, anti-correlated with depression or risk of depression. Um, but that being said, social awareness and awareness of uh, social cues uh, tends to be associated with it. And so maybe a follow-up question in that regard. All of us, many people in the audience will know that I was saying sort of the cup half full and the cup half empty. And there's some people that when they look at the cup, they say it's just half, it's only half full and the others say it's half empty. 
does that in any way explain what I would call a happiness set point, where some people are just genetically or maybe even emotionally higher happiness level than others? Do you have an experience with that in your, in your practice? So um, I, I did uh, engineering as an undergraduate, and if, uh, if one person says the, glass, the, 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 the optimist says the glass is half full, the pessimist says the glass is half empty, the engineer says the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> But in all seriousness, uh, yeah, I, I suppose um, there is, a, I mean, a, a hedonic uh, set point. That, that's been something that's been sort of uh, shown in the literature, that some people just tend to put higher numbers on those surveys that we give them about, um, about those things, and that tends to be uh, connected to various personality traits that are relatively fixed. So in, in a sense, the... Um, Happiness is defined as positive affect, or like the, uh, what you report in mo the momentary happiness it does tend to have a pretty big genetic component. Um, but I think that the, but I think that's why, why getting to the question of happiness is, and I don't know that I would, there, there's something deeper that's almost beyond words, and this is why it's difficult to, to talk about, but seeing somebody who is wrestling with the tragedy and, and overcomes that tragedy, there's something heroic about that. Um, and it's not exactly captured by positive affect. Yes, there's like a spike of positive affect after you like, you know, uh, figure out this, this challenge. And maybe you'd say you're, you're more content than you were before, but, but those things don't seem to get at the, the, the heroic quality of what it means to be a human wrestling with these deep issues. Um, and I, I unfortunately don't have a, a better um, definition uh, to, to, to explain that, but, but as an observation, um, I, I don't, think that some people are just better at the, are genetically set to have the good life and others are not. I don't think that the, uh, the, the affective set point really is all that important in terms of these, the, 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 the deep questions. Maybe I can bounce this to you, to Shimon. Um, I know that you, in, your, in your books and your writing you talk a lot about the brain as being this computational unit that will evolutionary pushes us forward to, um, to seek these peaks and valleys in happiness. Um, what about the biology? And um, all of us go through periods of emotional, and I'm talking about emotional mm -hmm. just being, uh, I don't know, hormonal or anything like that. What role does that play in determining once these peaks and valleys and how often they occur? Yeah, I, ha I have to, to note and stress that I don't separate the brain from the body and from the biology. The computation is the biology in this case. Uh, I'm, I was asked to write a review of the, the, the latest book by Antonio Damasio, uh, who wrote Descartes' Error, um, on, on the inseparability of feelings from thinkings and, 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 and of cognition from emotion. I, I completely buy into this framework. I, I will have to titrate my review so it's clear that I'm, I'm on his side, but I just construe computation more broadly. So the body participates, the rest of the body, in addition to the brain, participates in the computation and the emotions basically are in the computational sense. Um, they are computational shortcuts. In fact, there are papers in, in our community that make that statement explicitly by people who work on things like reinforcement learning, a big topic in artificial intelligence recently. Um, so uh, basically, emotions are algorithms that are, have been put in place that, that allow us not to give a second thought to things that need to be taken care of quickly and that, that have proved important uh, over evolutionary periods of time. So uh, we treat people who think like, like I do on, on those things, we treat emotions in the same way as we do all other functions or aspects of the mind uh, on multiple levels. To understand anything at all about the mind, um, you have to understand it on the, on the level of be behavior and evolution, and on the level of computational problems that it solves, on the level of actual procedures that solve the problems and on the level of implementation in neural tissue, in the hormonal system, and everything else. So you don't see emo emotions as being separate from the... Absolutely the not. Yeah. They, they, are, they are an in, in, in integral part in, 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 in such a way that if you don't experience emotions, something is seriously wrong with you. Uh, in the in the medical sense, and this, this is uh, I don't have to, to. And emotions being depression as well as anxiety as well as happiness. Is that the, the, the the system is very high dimensional and it, it's in delicate balance. And what surprises me often is is how relatively uh, infrequently it goes off whack. Uh, so many things can go wrong, and and uh, th th there is a normal range of variation 
of what those variables, and, and sometimes things get out of hand, and, and, and then we need to pause and, and, and think about what's going on. And again, ask for help, because uh, triangulating a problem is always better than just having a single view, especially from the inside, if you're, if you're part of the problem. So bouncing to you, Dave, and, uh, from what you meant said, asking for help, and I loved your little graphic that you put up there where how many years ago it was, we had three people we could talk to, and now there's really only one okay. person. And um, the question that I want to ask is, what role do you think social media has played in this narrowing down of people that we talk to individually and that we can rely on and talk to in terms of talking through issues that if we need to do that. Has social media brought us closer, separated us more, made it more impersonal, personal? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I do want to um, answer uh, a little bit on that, the, touch on the other one about what the nature of emotion is um, first. And I, and I think that uh, I agree, I think it's very useful to see emotions. Um, certainly one of the things they do is sort of the lightning calculator, the, um, uh, that, that we're able to sort of very quickly come up with an answer without having to really think through all of the different steps with, you know, uh, a more, you know, a, a different part of our brain. Um, but I think that it's uh, especially therapeutically, and I, sp I think on the human level also, the, the experience of sadness, the, the, the subjective conscious um, experience is, uh, I think, importantly qualitatively different between um, experiencing an emotion and doing a math problem. And, and perhaps it is, uh, you know, on some level, both of those. I, I agree with your assertions about the idea that both of those are modeled by computations. Um, I, I, I agree with that. But I think that the experience of, of sadness and, uh, and sitting with it and paying attention to it and being mindful of it and, and shifting your attention from, from the sadness to thoughts about the sadness to modifying the, the thoughts that you're, you're thinking, choosing some thoughts, of all the thoughts you have, choosing some out of others. Um, I think that that subjective experience um, and that those, those conscious choices you're making are, are critical to the, uh, to the equation. If you're a mathematician, they're actually very close to one another. So we, we feel, we feel every, through, throughout every bit of our cognition, we feel things and we do what we do. You know, we do psychiatry or psychology or other kind of science or teaching or, or agriculture. Whatever we do, we do with, with emotion and with thinking and they are inseparable. And as I said, you have to understand things at all levels and computation is just one of them. And of course, we have all the others, including how it feels like from the inside. Very important for us, of course. And to the uh, social media question. Um, the thing I like about that particular uh, statistic that I quoted um, that has been much debated in the literature that's not, uh, you know, epidemiology isn't exactly my, um, my focus, but the, 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 the three to one number was, uh, I believe it was uh, ending in 2004. Uh, 1985 to 2004 was the window there. Um, and so by 2004, we had lost from, you know, three to one um, median friends. Are we down to a quarter um, now? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't know the, I, I've, been, I, I've looked but haven't found the updated numbers I, I, um, in terms of uh, where, that, where that's gone. Um, I think that the, there, the, the, the statistics I found on college freshmen spending time with other people has dropped. Um, and there's also numbers on, uh, depression being associated with infinite scrolling through Facebook. Um, has anybody ever infinitely scrolled through Facebook when you uh, didn't actually? No one in this audience no, would of course. have done that. <laughs> of course, nobody does that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that either, because that, yeah, that doesn't make you feel great after <laughs> a few minutes. But, um, but uh, so I, I think that the, there's a lot of concern, and I think a, uh, a lot of, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing. There's a lot of concern, and I think that I am skeptical that that's making things a lot better, um, particularly because that, that is such a, it, it's so analogous to an addicted state of like, I'm just not paying attention and something is happening to me passively and it's really hard to stop infinite scrolling when you're like so deep and like all of the other things that social media has figured out how to do to, to hijack your brain. Um, that probably isn't good for you, um, even if we don't have like definitive evidence that it's bad. Um, I'm sort of coming to the end of my questions, but I've got two, I think, fairly provocative questions, one for you, Shimon, and one for you, David. Um, Shimon, I wanted to ask you, there was a statement that you wrote in um, some of your work uh, that said, um, we must have low periods in our life because if we're constantly happy all the time, we'll become lazy species and we will go extinct. And I'm, I'm taking from that that um, 
happiness and contentment and just pleasure with where you are at that moment is at feeding into somehow an extension of the species. Do you want to try and explain that to me? <laughs> this is somewhat of a ham-handed evolutionary phrasing of, of the argument, which, which I, I keep repeating, I keep returning to, to evolution as uh, uh, you know, the queen of the universe, which she is. Um, uh, I guess we shouldn't take that statement literally. I think it was Saint Clement of Alexandria who wrote in the preface to his Stromata that he was worried a bit publishing his book because it's like giving a sword, handing a sword to a child. You know, once you publish some precise language, you'll be taken to the task for that, for those words anyway. Um, uh, I, I think, though, figuratively speaking about those things, I, I, I stand behind that statement. Uh, in fact, one can identify um, useful uh, contributions uh, uh, that, that are brought about by periods of, 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 of maybe even negative affect. For instance, uh, I, uh, as far as I know, um, negative affect, maybe even mild depression, helps focus, including, of course, focus on things which you shouldn't be focusing on. But for things like problem solving, um, uh, joy is just not the right state. Joy is good for creativity. If you want to follow up on your creative burst, you should just calm down and, 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 uh, and maybe you know, give up a bit of your happiness for a bit of uh, a, a lower state. So that's another kind of semi-evolutionary uh, hand-waving argument, but I think one can marshal the evidence in support of that view. So David, um one of the statements that you made that would really resound had been with me and, and it went through your quotations from Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount as well and that is love, 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 love is the way, giving, giving away things is what the source of happiness is. Um, I would probably say that 100% of the people in the audience would say the times that they've been most unhappy is when they've loved someone and that someone has really hurt them really substantially. And um, broken relationships and uh, intimacy that comes with relationships often comes with a great ability to hurt other people and the resulting happiness. Do you want to uh, explain a little bit of how love can not hurt and how you can use it to um, foster happiness in one's life? I mean, other than just the good times. I'm talking about true intimate love now, love where you're vulnerable to somebody else. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, uh, what, as I was paring down this talk from uh, longer than 10 minutes to 10 minutes, that was uh, sadly one of the things that, uh, that, that got cut, and I'm glad you asked the question. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that there is a way to love deeply um, in this world without pain. Um, I, I think that that's a, uh, an inevitability, um, and I think that's why the English word happiness tends to be problematic in this, and I think that uh, you know, people have variously tried to translate that word Jesus used. I mean, some people have translated, oh, how happy are, um, but that doesn't seem quite right. Um, like, clearly, oh, how a positive affect are people who are mourning? Like, no, that's, that's just literally a contradiction. I mean, um, it's not a paradox. I mean, there, there's no depth there. So, uh, you know, a blissful, blessed, I, I think that um, shifting from trying to maybe ride this, this high of positive affect um, and that as a goal isn't necessarily a, um, either doable or even a good idea. Um, and so trying to find something deeper, something, um, something different, something that is more profound. Um, and I, I'd say that on, on the secular perspective, this sort of uh, maybe stoic idea of, uh, of, of facing the tragedy of life as a hero, uh, you know, gritting your teeth against the, the fates, I mean, that's that's cooler than just like trying to chase the next happiness high. Um, that's at least a little bit more profound, and I think the Christian answer is to say, you know, it's blessedness, it's self-sacrifice, and yeah, it's going to hurt, it's even going to kill you. I mean, this is the, the uh, take up your cross language, um, that you should be willing to die, and you know, uh, either a big death at the end or a lot of little deaths to your enemies or people who annoy you or, you know, your, your partner, and it's, it's going to hurt, and it's going to hurt a lot, and that's, but that's not, that's, the, the, the pain is not, uh, the opposite of this thing that we're looking for, the, the blessedness or the bliss. 
Um, David, some ways in which uh, we're taught at Sunday school or in our churches or even in our synagogues is that um, happiness is not to be found in this life. And a lot of people will interpret the Sermon on the Mount as blessed of those who mourn, blessed are the poor, because your reward will be in heaven. Do you think that from a Christian perspective, happiness is only a state to be achieved in the next iteration of life, or is happiness to be found in this life? Uh, both. I think, I think this is one of those uh, beautiful paradoxes. You know, if you ask Jesus at various times in the Gospels, like, is the kingdom of heaven here? It's like, it's coming. Or, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's upon you. It's imminent. So there's sort of this, like, tension of, in some sense, it's already here. In some sense, it's, it's coming. Um, and I think the, uh, the, there's the, the serenity prayer um, that the, the first few lines um, are often remembered. Uh, God grant me the serenity. Uh, to accept the things I cannot change, um, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, and the prayer goes on to, uh, to, ex- to several more lines. I think this was written by ne- Niebuhr. Um, but the, uh, one of the later lines in the, in the prayer is um, the, uh, that I will be able to be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy in the next. Um, and I think that, I mean, even if you look at the numbers, um, in the United States, which might be a very special case, um, it, it seems like rates of depression are, uh, are lower amongst those who frequently attend religious service um, and much lower uh, rates of, of suicide. Now, this is observational data. It's not randomized. It's in a single country. There's all sorts of problems with that, so maybe there's some evidence that, you know, the community or the spiritual connection, but, you know, but certainly that's... that's I, I doubt that that's going to be true in, you know, in a place where you know, Christianity isn't quite as well accepted. Um, so I think in those cases, you really do have to look to, to something else. Or, or, um, but, but maybe you don't. I mean, I spent a year in Kenya, and you know, in extreme poverty, there's a, lot more, there's a lot more positive affect there than I would have expected. Um, so I, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So um, as we sort of wind up the, the structural part of this um, dialogue and wait for the audience questions, uh, maybe we could just give each of you a, a minute or so to say, what would you like to leave with the students in the room in terms of how they, can, how they can achieve happiness, how they can deal with bad things that happen in their lives and turn that around? And the, you know, particularly the stressful environment of Cornell where it is a stressful period. It's a very uh, charged environment for fall and spring semesters. So maybe I'll ask both of you to wind up. David. Oh. So I think the piece of advice that I would give is that if you're looking for happiness, there's a lot of things that your, your organism, your, your body, the below the neck body it, it, that's, that's good for it, that is going to help you be a lot happier. So things like exercise and diet. And, um, but then you're also a mammal, and so like spending time with other people is actually really, really important. Um, and that as college, college is getting increasingly more competitive and more and more uh, emphasis on not having discussions till 3 a.m. about the nature of the universe, like focus on that 3 a.m. discussion. That's what college is, <laughs> That's what college is, is, is great for. Um, and that yes, you know, grades are important and all of that, but like, this, I think there tends to be, as I, as I talked about in my talk, that this, this de-emphasis on these hard-to-measure things, on, on the, the, the humanities or the social sciences or discussions about these things, and an emphasis on things that can be measured um, more easily by GPA or you know, expected income for, your first, you know, for the job that you're looking for. So I'd say focus on those things, uh, on those things and in the process, especially while you're here, you know, go on this quest, try to find out these, the, this, this deeper stuff that I was that I was suggesting, um, you know, how can you live in a life where you're guaranteed to die? How do you live in a world with uh, all of this, all of the suffering that's around you? Like, what are the possible answers to those deep questions? Um, I think that this is a great place to explore that, and especially if, if those are the things that are um, weighing you down. Um, and if things do get serious, absolutely seek help. I mean, that, that's, you know, talk to a, talk to a professional. Um, that's a, a very important thing as well. You're not suggesting turning off Facebook then, that's not one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of things that you know what is making you miserable. 
Like, it, it's not, it's, it's the rare patient that I come to who doesn't know something that to do to make, make their life just a little bit better. Like, if your life isn't as happy as you want it to be, pick something that you know is making you less happy and, and change that thing. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's all sorts of good arguments to be had about, you know, what is the ultimate meaning of reality and such, but, like, <laughs> you know what's making you miserable, at least in part, <laughs> to change that. Stop it. <laughs> um, and, of course, you know, it's not always easy to just stop it, but, like, you know, with help and community, talking to professionals, you know, by yourself, do those things that you know how to do to make your life less miserable. Um, and Sometimes you can't give up organic chemistry. You just got to take it. Though. Exactly. You know, it's that like <laughs> that problem set. You know, I just wanted can't to do just the extra one. Yeah. I, I would second definitely all of that. I, I used to to think that the advice, the classical ancient Greek advice, know thyself, was the ultimate one-liner you know, as advices go. But I think what I the, the quote I offered earlier from Virgil, uh, "Happy is he who knows the causes of things," is. Even more important, because if you look into yourself, you'll know what are the causes of your condition, maybe with some help and with some science on your side. And, and you can also look around you and look at the systemic causes of your happiness or unhappiness. And that, that transcends the, the first saying, the no, knowing of yourself, because we are part, as humans, we are part of society and we, we can't flourish without the, the participation in the society and without help on, on part of the society. And also maybe a, a parting bit of advice. Uh, uh, three days ago, it was the birthday of the great German Jewish uh, revolutionary, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, who, who said that uh, if, if you don't move, you can feel your chains. So move, and the mental chains are the most difficult ones to discern, move. And of course, they can always come and see you in your office, right? We you can always you, do that. We yeah. heard you extend that invitation. Yep. So I think maybe we can take some questions from the audience now. Um, is Rebecca going to bring me some questions? There we go. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. So maybe, David, I'll ask you this question. It seems closest to you. What's the difference between happiness and joy? Um, is there any difference? You'd have to, uh, so I suppose those things could be defined and have been defined in uh, innumerable ways. Um, so there's certainly a uh, one Christian construct on joy, joy being, um, you know, uh, something that is maybe the uh, maybe a word talking about the state that I, I was talking about, sort of a synonym for blessedness, um, where you can have joy all the time, even if you're really sad and mourning. Um, that there's this state of, of uh, blessedness that maybe saints talk about, or, or you know, great great people talk about, or maybe you've experienced a, in having a, a really transcendently important moment of grief. Um, that that might found, that might count as um, as joy, but. But I think that uh, separating, I, I think it, it might be a useful way, among other useful ways, to separate out the positive affect, which is, you know, smiling a lot from the, the, the deeper life contentment kind of thing. Mm. How would you look at that, Shimon? Is the joy that, that ever-elusive catch and release that you see? Yeah, I can speak to the experience of saints, and in any case, I've argued in a different context, actually, with regard to Buddhist saints, that... Becoming one means ceasing to be a human, for which I was jumped upon by a bunch of Buddhists, which is kind of surprising, <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, but uh, on, on, uh, on a computational, kind of psychological level, um, I think joy has been defined um, more, more specifically. I mean, apart from the answer that can be obtained by asking someone how you feel right now, if they actually feel that, um, as uh, the... the uh, feeling you get, the, 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 the evaluation you, you obtain with regard to the rate of your current progress towards your current goal, which actually takes care of the attainment because once you attain, once you have attained your goal, that kind of goes down and you're set for the switch to the next goal. And this has been actually used in fields like robotics to make, to build self-motivating systems that experience something like um, emotions, and I can speak to that if you give me a couple hours. Okay. 
So maybe I'll bounce off a <laughs> next next forum, <laughs> next forum. Um, so maybe I'll bounce back to a question that I had because you've just referred to that, um, David. In one of the courses you teach at Stanford under your splash, you talk about willpower. Um, what will this willpower play in sort of controlling your emotions and making yourself happy? Are we? Is it just the stronger people with more willpower that are more likely to overcome things that depress them? Well, it's it's a it's a great question, and I, I've wrestled and been on numerous sides in my own mind on whether or not the word willpower is useful and helpful. Um, but I think that uh, the idea of being able to to sort of exert your effort and do something uh, that you want to do that might be hard to do um, against some sort of resistance uh, that that is a very useful thing for humans to be able to do and is, in, is one of the things that allows us to do all sorts of things like, you know, go to college and, you know, complete the organic chemistry assignment as we referred right, to right, earlier. Right, like, right, it, it's, right. a, it's a very useful thing and, you know, you look at some of the things like, you know, building a cathedral or something. It takes like 10 generations and it's like, wow, like you're really just sacrificing all sorts of present things for this future vision of some cathedral that neither you nor your children nor your children's 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 children will see. I mean, it's, it's astonishing that humans have this ability. Now, um, that's more of economic slavery than willpower. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I have various views on the, the, these, these, these uh, uh, things that have been built, but I, I think the question of uh, willpower specifically is um, very, um, you, you can have there are situations when you can have too much, when you sort of are, and in psychiatry we talk about this all the time, of like suppressing these emotions. I don't want to deal with these, I'm just going to push them down, I'm going to push them aside, I'm not going to deal with it, I'm just going to do this thing, but, but not actually dealing with the problem. And so willpower can be used in ways to like avoid things, um, and that, that, that's a short-term strategy that's going to fail as a, a long-term strategy. Um, but then there's also other things of like, yeah, if you, if you exert willpower in a particular way, you'll get a college degree and then you might be able to get a decent job and then you'll be able to have a, you know, some sort of economic stability. So it's got, um, it's got benefits but can be, uh, can be overused and misused. Um, I think the, the misuse might be sort of people who've got willpower are sort of stronger and people who don't exercise that willpower are more likely to be depressed and therefore weaker individuals. And I think that's a really wrong way to look at it but it does lead one down that path of sort of will being the sort of stronger version of that. Yeah, and I think the thing that I've been thinking more about is, is not so much the individual exerting, uh, exerting force in a particular direction. Um, addiction is a great example. You can't will yourself out of being an alcoholic. You can't just say, I'm going to really tr try really hard today to not drink. Your willpower is not capable of doing that anymore. Your brain has gone off the rails and is now all about getting alcohol. Um, and so what you need to do is focus your willpower on something that you can do. Show up to a meeting. I can, I can once a week go to this particular location and talk about what life is. And, and that, seems to, that seems to be the way to get out of, or at least one of the ways to get out of addiction. So I'd say that, um, so too with depressions, you know, I'm just going to not be sad today. It's like, that's... That's probably not going to work. Right, right. Um, maybe at like minor levels, or maybe if you're a little, if you've got the blues, but like once you've got major depressive disorder, you're probably going to need to talk to somebody to get kind of coached on like what, the, the limited amount of willpower you have now reduced because you are depressed. What are you going to focus it on? And that's what a therapist can help you figure out. Like if you if you think these thoughts instead of those thoughts in these particular times, you can practice that. That's something you're capable of. But finding those like windows of opportunity for applied willpower are diff is difficult sometimes. So we have sent this question, and I think this is probably the most honest question we've got so far on this list. I love this question, and I'm going to put it out to both of you. Can humans be happy in the midst of mental, emotional, and physical stress? And if so, how so? Occasionally, yes. In fact, some people, uh, as uh, I think that cartoon from the Times that I showed, and as you mentioned, some people thrive on stress uh, up to a point. Um, so definitely yes, uh, don't overdo it for reasons that can be, I think, spelled out, uh, but um, yes, I mean, who, who is not stressed at some point or maybe often uh, during the week um, uh, throughout your life? I mean, this is, uh, it, it, it's a rare condition. I wouldn't say it, it's even a blessing to be never stressed at all. So yes, I guess the bottom line is yes. Okay, so we're coming to the end. I want to just ask one or two last questions. And David, I'm going to send this one to you. Uh, is believing in God, does believing in God make you happier? 
uh, does believing in evolution make you unhappier? So go back and forth between the two of you. Great question, whoever submitted that. Well, I don't know about the comparator, um, but... <laughs> Wait, uh, I, I believe think in neither of us both would know really, right? Because yeah. we don't know the other side. Well, let's, <laughs> let's spin off a few randomized universes and see what happens. <laughs> right. um, I, uh, well, I, believing in both God and evolution makes... Uh, I believe in both God and evolution, <laughs> and I am happy. Uh, <laughs> oh, and still expected then? Okay, so, you know, I guess part of my temperament is uh, uh, deep satisfaction uh, in not having to answer to a higher authority. Well, and, and I think that this is, maybe this ties into the last question too. Um, the, the, the question of, of a person who is experiencing, and I, I've just talked to so many, a person who's experiencing just all of these tragedies, all of this stress, all of this, like, this, this burden, um, you know, and, and I, I and I and my, my heart just aches for people in that condition, whether it's the questioner or not. Um, you know, but but I think it, it, it gets to this, it gets to the the, the, the question of, of the, the more profound thing. Um, the answer is, I think that yeah, there are times when you sort of randomly bounce up, but you know, and sometimes in major depression, you don't really bounce up at all. Like, I remember I, I, one patient told me that, uh, you know, a good, a good day for her, she gets out of bed and walks around the block. That's, that's, that's the bounce up is the walking around the block. And that's it. Um, and, that's just, and that's just tragic. But I think that the thing that really, that, that, that responding to the tragedy is something that humans do well. And I think that can, you can have a life of significance and meaning and purpose in, in wrestling with that heroically um, rather than submitting to it. And the patient I told you about was seeing me, was trying to respond to it. And, and that, I think, um, has significance um, by itself. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, for, for myself, in the face of tragedies that I've faced and, and things that have been really, really bad for me, I had a, a terrible disability when I was in, um, a terrible pain and back pain when I was in high school, and, and wrestling through that was very difficult. Um, and, but I think that the, the idea that there, there is a loving God who, allows this to happen, but is, is ultimately, it's going to be okay. Um, I think also from Lord of the Rings, uh, the, the quote from, uh, I think it was from Sam, um, when he sees Gandalf again, um, is every sad thing going to come untrue? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so David, maybe we can bring this around to the great analogy that you used about the sled dogs. Now, I'm an absolutely dedicated dog lover, <laughs> and uh, I've always wanted to actually own one of those huskies that can do the I did a ride in, but I, they are bred to run. And that's their purpose. And I think the last question that we asked is, does God give you that purpose that you actually connected through to happiness in your life? You, 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 talk, you talked about being purposeful and having a meaning in your life is the source of happiness. And is the sled dog analogy, is, is, is God the answer for you in terms of happiness? And how does the absence of answering to a higher power bring happiness in one case? and purpose and happiness in the other? I think for purpose, we tend to be more satisfied with being a part of something that's, that's, that's big, that's great. That I can do some small project by myself, but if, like, if a team of people does it, like if I'm part of a bigger story um, that, that we're working together on, you know, uh, building a, a Saturn V rocket or, or you know, do, uh, doing some amazing work together, that, that's even more exciting. And I think for me, the, the idea of, yes, I'm individually loving, but the whole point of, of cosmic history is for all of us to, uh, to together, uh, love one another better and better in this, in this, in this uh, fashion together. Uh, th that's exciting to me, and that, that gives me a sense of, of purpose and direction. And I think that, yes, it's, it's sort of belief in God, but I think that that word, I mean, the word God itself is so, um, I, I, disconnected from what, in most people's minds, from this idea of a narrative, of a story, of a romance, um, and it's the it's that that story that is that, that gives me the, the the purpose, or that that's the the, the meaning, the, the story that I'm plugging myself into um, to to be a part of this bigger thing. Jamal, what story do you believe in that um, that would give you? 
a purpose. You said something about not having a purpose, or not having a story, or not being part not, of the greater. Not having a master. I guess I'm, I'm more identified with the with the person in the sled than with the dogs that pull the sled. Mm -hmm. uh, but on another level, um, uh, I think there is enough purpose to find outside oneself um, without appealing to uh, hypothetical entities. And uh, this probably makes people happier, actually, becoming, becoming working for a larger cause. And uh, God knows there are enough large causes um, uh, around us, we just have to look around and, and, and put ourselves to some, to some purpose and, uh, and help others and, and help, help ourselves as well. And, and, and if, you're, if you're really good, truly good, you don't need divine supervision for that. You, need, you don't need the threat of uh, hellfire to, to, to drive you to be good. And you just know by knowing yourself and knowing the, the ones, the, 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 the people surrounding you um, for what they are, you know what's the right thing to do. So there's natural foundation for morality and there is natural foundation for, for happiness as well. So I suppose that's just to end up with, I think that's one thing that you both really solidly agree with, is that being part of something that is good and a cause that is really good brings you happiness. So uh, um, can you join me in please thanking our speakers for tonight? And that's